Okay, well, we're here today with Tanya Williams, and we were so excited to just take a trip down memory lane and to uh, speak with her. For those who don't know, Tanya was born in London, England, and she grew up in Oshawa, Ontario. She's a graduate of Ryer Ryerson University, perhaps best uh, known as Dr. Winters on The Young and the Restless for nearly 15 years, but also fondly remembered as a host on The Polka Dot Door. Tanya, thank you so much for being here with us today. It's oh, so great to see you. It's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> well, tell us a little bit about your background growing up and how you even got involved in television. I was born in London, England. Both my parents are Jamaican. They were actually, they had met. It's so funny, like Jamaicans have to leave Jamaica to meet each other. But they met in England and got married there. My father was finishing law school, my mother finishing um, being a nurse, registered nurse. And they got married and then I was born and then we moved back to Jamaica. And I lived there for about five, six years. Um, then my parents um, separated, divorced, and my mom and I moved back to England where I lived till I was about 12. And then came to Canada, came to Oshawa, which was absolutely fantastic and the, the the journey really of my life I felt like a lot of the journey of my life started then you know in in what my interests were now it's interesting you mentioned growing up in England do you have any rec a recollection of watching Doctor Who which would have begun in the 60s in England or any recollection of Play School which was the show that uh, Polka Dot Door was based off of no, I never saw Play School, um, unless Play School was that show. There was one show that I remember I would race home from school every day. It literally started at 4, 4.30, and I, now it seems funny to think about it, but I actually watched a guy reading a book. <laughs> he was just <laughs> sitting in a chair reading a book, and then there would be another camera that when he turned the pages, it would show the illustration. Oh, wow. I was mesmerized by this show, and this was like, this was cutting-edge television, you know, somebody reading a book. Um, I don't remember it's that Doctor Who was on when I was watching TV, but I did get the, I got the comic strip. Was I got a comic that was delivered every week, and it was a Doctor Who and the Daleks, and I would read that, but uh, no, I didn't see that on TV, but you know what was great? Some of the shows that were on TV, especially when you're a kid who who's black, you know, then it, there there was Tarzan. I remember watching that, and the only time you ever saw black people when when they were the tribes, you know, they were like you know, people carrying spears <laughs> or something, or or some American shows I would watch where they would be slaves mm. um, or servants or or something like that. But those were the only images that I saw. Um, uh, growing up until there was a show called Julia mm. with Diane Carroll in it and that just blew my mind it was called um, it was called Julia yeah it was just called Julia and here it was she was a nurse working in this doctor's office um, a single mom because her husband had passed away or something and she was raising her son Corey and that blew my mind I was watching something that was like normal, uh, you know, who was, right. it was a, a black person who had spoke well, was eloquent and looked fantastic, she was beautiful and she was, she looked like all the people that I knew who were black up until that point. I never actually met any tribes people <laughs> or any <laughs> slaves, <laughs> so I didn't know any but, um, but I remember how that impacted me as a young person. And then, of course, in the 1980s, we had, you know, the great contribution by Bill Cosby and The Cosby Show. And finally, you know, after Sanford and Son and the Jeffersons and all in the family, finally we have a working class black family on, on American television showing that us was huge. that, that, that it was, below the That was the so huge because, I mean, all, all shows have their place and Sanford and Son and those, they were funny and they had their place and they certainly, um, you know, just to start the process, you know, they, they were right. there. But... But um, yeah, the Cosby Show was it was on its own stratosphere, and I don't think people saw that family as black after a while. They just saw it as a family. I mean, Absolutely. it was the same issues that brothers and sisters and, yep. and husbands and wives and fathers and mothers. You know, it was the same thing that everybody dealt with, yep. and I and I think that really changed the the whole feel and culture of of television for for black people anyway. And that's um, really that's really the way it ought to be. And and I'm so yeah. thankful that 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 show was the success it was. Yeah. 
Um, what was it like working in Toronto TV in the days of, you know, live television? And then, of course, in the 1970s during revolutionary times, you got Moses and Nimer in the creation of City TV, the, the, the second city television crew, and then other notable networks and personalities. And, of course, you were up there dancing your heart out on Boogie. What, what, what was it yeah. like? What, tell us it a little bit about what it was funny, though, like. because I don't think live TV was still happening by the time I started. Okay. Because uh, even when I danced on Boogie, that was a taped... Um, show that they would you know edit and then and then show later but um but polka dot door i remember what a great i didn't know that much about tv ontario and i didn't know that much about polka dot door i remember my agent just calling me up because at the time when i started my career i mean i don't know how other people got acting work but mine was just it was boring mine was just that your agent called you and told you there was an audition and then you went to the audition mm -hmm. um and i think when he said oh you have this audition it's you know this show polka, polka dot door um, and you have to remember, I mean, a lot of people, I think they got the idea that I worked for years on Polka Dot Door, that, that, you know, I got this gig and then for years I worked on it. That's really not how it worked. Um, you basically went for this audition and then they said, yes, we want to hire Tanya for this week. You know, you and another host worked for this one week shooting these shows and then you never saw them again for, you, you know, maybe a year later, then they'd say, oh, we'd like to hire Tanya for another week. You know, and this happened for four years in a row. So basically, it was four weeks wow. that I worked on Polka Dot Door, and they played those four weeks so many times that people would come up to me and they thought I had a full time job working all the time at Polka Dot Door. I wish, <laughs> <laughs> but it wasn't that way, and that's how it was for all the hosts. We just um, did our one week, and then they just played them and rerun them over and over again. Now, one of the most remarkable things about your time on Polka Dot Door is, as far as I can tell, you were the first woman of color that uh, that was actually on the show as a host. Um, how, what was it like being, especially starting off at such a young age, what, what was it like being a woman of color in this industry, and did you face any stereotypes uh, as a young woman at that time? I definitely faced stereotypes, but not on Polka Dot Door. That's the wonderful thing about Polka Dot Door is no matter what the hosts look like, it's fairly a standard, you know. They all appear the same, um, and I and I love that about the show. It was it was colorblind, and I mean, for young kids watching it, it was just there was always just a girl and a guy. That's all you knew. <laughs> however the girl looked, however the guy looked, we all danced the same and sang the same and said the same things and played with the same toys, so there really wasn't the feeling that, oh, this this black girl is acting different than if it were a white girl on. And I, and I liked that about the show. And I think it taught a lot of young people, you know, to have very positive images about different people of color. Um, but in other parts of the business, I would say there were very stereotypical things. A lot of the roles would be for um, if it were someone black, then they were looking for them to be prostitutes or drug addicts or illiterate in some way, on the street, homeless, you know. So those kind of stereotypes continued to to play in. And I know for, I think I was really fortunate because I was so young, it was rare that I would, you know, be asked to go for those kind of roles. So I... I think I didn't have to make those kind of decisions. I felt more for the actors, actresses in particular, who were older, but they were, it was always stereotypes. And you know what? The, a lot of that hasn't gone away because I still talk to actors now who complain about the only roles are they're illiterate, they're drug addicts, they're prostitutes. It's, how do, it's how do, as a woman of color, how does that make you feel? It's frustrating. Um, I think the only way to change these kind of perceptions is when you get in the driver's seat. It, you, you have to become the person who is producing or writing or directing or ma you know making the product yourself. If, if you want to see something different, you're going to have to do it for yourself. But uh, but I still see a lot of stuff on. In fact, I would say it's even sometimes I want to think of it as worse because it's not just about being a black woman. Women in general sometimes are being are so objectified and you know in, in such a sexual way that it's very it's very difficult now to watch a show um, it's almost like the epitome of a strong woman is a woman who has a great deal of sex on her own terms that that's representative of what a strong woman is and I think that kind of thing is is it can be very damaging especially for young people if you if you could give a message of what you think are the qualities uh, of, a, of, a, of a strong woman on TV color aside what, right. what kind of attributes uh, do you do you aspire and want to aspire to young women? I think it first starts with knowing yourself in a really strong way and having um, 
having a message that like but a positive message feeling that you can be someone who can inspire but on every level um, women aren't just about thinking about sex you know it's like it's 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 thinking about how do you help your community and and how do you be a good friend to someone and how do you how are you a good listener and how, how do you just help move the conversation forward in in knowing what you bring I, I'm not one of those people that believes men and women are the same we're very different and what makes us uniquely different is the, are these very positive things and and to embrace being a woman you know being a being a woman is not just being a guy but as a female we bring a lot to the table and I think women have a great deal of sensitivity and insight and intuition um, that, that just needs to be resonating and and what we feel about um, home and, and 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 how we want the world to be. A, a lot of times, if I watch politics, like I just watched with Obama and Mitt Romney, sometimes I go, there needs to be a woman in between. There. There's way too much testosterone going on, you know, and, and the kind of like pushing and shoving, and and you're thinking that's really not leadership. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it's it's really a male energy, and it it shouldn't be decreased. It's a male energy, but it works so well balanced with a more female energy that's about. We don't need to be pushing and shoving, and the aggression can be toned back. And let's make it more about a dialogue, and let's make it more about opinions, and th let's be more thoughtful. Um, and I think we should be having more characters that sort of resonate those really wonderful qualities that women bring to the table. Um, Tanya, when researching your career, it became so apparent um, that you've had the opportunity to work with a lot of people, specifically from your time at TVO. And I know Polka Dot Door was your, your main thing there. When you think about your time at TVO, who, even as a young woman, who made an impact on your life while you were there, and how did they make that impact? Um, I think definitely Ted Conybrenner, because even though I, I don't know if he created the show, I mean, he was the one that brought it over from England, I'm not sure, but he was certainly the person that knew absolutely everything about the show and um, and his passion for it, and to be true to it. I mean, there were... You, you would literally, you know, this is the way, way the bear is held, this is, you know, he, he was very specific about how he wanted the actors to interact with the toys and, and, and just how the whole feel and look of the show. He was very meticulous about those things and I always, I just always appreciated people who are passionate about the thing that they do and, and meticulous, but, but the impact is less about, for me, impacts are always less about people and more about circumstances and I think when I got the job I was like oh great a gig you know that's what you're thinking but as I was working on the show there is something really magical about and it's too bad they're doing the show the way it is now there's something magical about the fact that these toys do not move and they don't actually say anything um, and just the fascination of creating that imagination in a child where you're picking up a, a, a toy and you're like what's that you're absolutely right, Mary Golder, you know, whatever, and you're talking, and when I would look back, I go, that is so cool, the fact that these animals, these, these toys, bears or animals or whatever, they're not talking, and, but you think they are, and you think that the host is hearing it, and every host really came across that way, like, like, there was a life happening, and when you saw this, the, the sound stage, I mean, it is a small little space, but on camera, it feels like this world, this magical world with sandboxes and you know all these things going on and games and I and I, I love the fact that the games were so just small and fun but they were so educational at the same time without without being aware all the songs you know kids knew those songs and just sang them over and over and over they kept the tune so simple and the words were um, you know, kids just learn a lot from that, and and in a positive way. I mean, there's so little. There's nothing raunchy about the show. There's nothing um, inappropriate even for young people about the show. And I, I I loved being a part of something like that. So I think the impact was was just. I wish there were actually shows like that now. I I don't know why people need to make it just because the technology is there. Let's just take away all the imagination for children, and let's just lay it at their <laughs> their laps. I like the idea that the kids have to come in and believe this world that we created, and they did. 
tell us about how you were first hired at TVO. If you can, you know, go through the cobwebs of your mind and kind of bring yeah, back yeah, to yeah. how it all came about. Who hired you and how did this job came about and was this your first television gig? No, it wasn't my first television gig, but um, I don't remember if it was Ted Connie Bear. I'm assuming I auditioned for Ted Connie Bear, but I can't remember who it was. You, you just like everything that I've ever booked, it's been a specific process. My agent calls me and says, "There's an audition for this thing." They send you, you know, a bit of the script of the words you're going to say, and you go in. I probably just had to sing a little something, you know, nothing like huge, just to hear that I'm not tone deaf, and 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 um, they probably had me talking to one of the animals just to see do 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 I look like I can animate with an animal with a with a toy that's not doing anything and. Uh, and that's all I remember of it. And then a call saying, oh, you, you've booked this week. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't know who the other person was I was going to be working with. You never really do. And then as it got closer, oh, yeah, you're working with this person who I probably didn't know. And, and then you get there, and, um, and it was fun. And I remember, what I remember is that they shot way out. They didn't shoot at where their location was, with, you know, on Young Street. They didn't shoot there. They shot way out, like... Um, near Humber College in some uh, studio where, where that was out there. I don't even remember what that was, but I remember being a long drive out there. <laughs> I do remember that. We were chatting before about who your co-host was, and the clip that we have, I think his name is Peter Vander Bent or something like that. I don't know if any of that rings a bell. Right. But, uh, I do remember a Peter, yeah. a blonde guy with, with yep. blue eyes. I do remember a Peter, yeah. And, and I think his character name on the show, I think, I think at one point you're calling him Derek, so I don't know if he, had a, a, if he went by a different name on show. I know some hosts... It's so went, weird because I, th I thought we just went by our real names. Maybe he wanted to be called Derek. I don't know. Maybe that's what he told me his name was. <laughs> you know, some have suggested that TV Ontario was really a pioneer in leading children's education. Uh, one person said it this way, that it was a very experimental and creative time. How would you describe the atmosphere of TVO and the family of people that you worked with on Polka Dot Dora? Again, I know it was brief. It was only those four weeks that you did shows. But um, from the time there, would you do you resonate with those comments? Was it a very creative and um, experimental time in children's education, in your opinion? It absolutely was. And by the time I got on the show, it had been around. Because when did the show start? When did 1971. So by the time I was on, we're talking 79 or 80 or 81. So they were a tight ship. You know, it was, it was not the beginning of the show. Um, it was a fantastic environment to work in. They People took it very seriously, and every bit of the crew, from hair and makeup, you know, to all the crew people, they, they took it very seriously. And I know that um, I remember. I think one actor said something like, "You know, don't mess with the toys. Like, you know, don't don't make fun of them. They they, they don't actually. They didn't look at that as funny. <laughs> they like they they treated these toys with a great deal of respect. Like, you didn't like." You know, anything lewd, you didn't just, you know, hang a toy. Or you didn't make jokes about the toys, even when you were, um, even when it cut. I think everybody was just so respectful that the, these toys were value, you know, they were really valuable commodities. We were interchangeable, the hosts. <laughs> it's the, the toys were the stars of the show, and hosts just came and went. It's so funny you mention that, because I interviewed Rex Hagen, who was a host in, in 1976, 1977, Right. He he said the exact yeah. same thing. You you do not make jokes and you do not mess, <laughs> you know, with the toys. So, um, how long were you uh, doing stuff with TV Ontario? Did you do anything after Polka Dot Door? Or was Polka Dot Door the only show that you worked on no, for them? No, Polka Dot Door was the only show I worked on there. I had been doing because because it's only one week. You can imagine we're working all the time, so I'm doing TV commercials yeah. and um, I, I I had a big. I had a big commercial running pretty much at the same time. It was a wear a mustache milk commercial, but it was like a national campaign. So it was billboards and commercials and appearances and all kinds of different things were going on. So I was doing that. And then at CBC, I worked as guest on some of the shows like, uh, you know, Street Legal and whatever. So it's like you're just being a working actor. You're just going, and then there's, um, you know, theater going on. So you're just working, and, and, uh, and this was one of it. So it was great. I would have continued going if they'd hired me for another week after or another week after. But um, it was pretty much the four weeks. The, the environment that you are uh, suggesting seems that it could be one that's conducive to, um, you know, kind of getting lost in the shuffle. Would it, the people that you worked with, in, in, especially in the late 70s and 80s, um, going from gig to gig, 
would you be respected as a person or was there this element that when you start at the bottom of the chain that you just kind of got to prove yourself and people aren't going to really, you're here for this and you get in and you do it and you're gone. What, what, I think, I think now because there's so much stuff on TV and so many channels, um, that kind of thinking would probably make sense now. But we're talking back in the, back then there was very little television and everything was the bottom of the food chain. <laughs> it was like, there wasn't, to me, there wasn't like, oh, this is a more elevated thing and this wasn't. I think all actors in Canada, we were just trying to be employed and it didn't matter what you did. Whether we did commercial, or you did musical theater, <laughs> whether you did a children's show, whether you did a nighttime drama, it was just getting work. I think that changed maybe after the mid 80s mm -hmm. where more sophisticated programs started to come on, but I, I, I I think I I don't know who all the hosts were, but I know I met a woman called Nani Griffin, and Nani worked in the I I did a play with her, and one of the things we had in common was she did polka dot door, but in the days when it first started, and and she was a highly respected theater actress. So I think when polka dot door started, I don't know who some of the other actors were, but I think they were some of the best respected theater actors in Canada. Uh, so that just goes to show people just needed to work and. Um, it's not like it is now where I think people go, oh, I'm in a reality show, that means I can't make a jump to, you know, this, or I'm, I'm a big movie star, so I can't right. do that. I mean, it's a very, it was very different. Yeah. We, we weren't thinking of a star system. You just wanted to work to and work, make yeah. some sort of money. Well, it's been interesting. I had mentioned, you know, this one clip that we have of you, and, and the comments that people have left on this clip of you are, are just so glowing, because obviously, humble beginnings with Polka Dot Door, but you've gone on to have such an incredible career, you know, as a, as a soap, soap, uh, soap star, but also, you know, to be a voice um, for, for people of color and some of your contributions that you've made today. So it's really cool to see how, um, you know, humble beginnings, but it was just the, you know, the beginning for you. And then to see the mix, like you're saying, someone like Nani who was involved, who was already an established um, actor. Um, do you remember anything about um, seeking out this this job when it first came about? Did somebody come to you, or did, were you just looking and you went in for an audition like you would have with any other? No, I don't think I knew about Polka Dot Door or had ever heard about Polka Dot Door because by then we're talking, you know, I'm 18, 19, I wouldn't be watching Polka Dot Door and I didn't have any <laughs> children or, or anything like that. So, no, it would have been an agent saying, you have an audition. Right. Be going, what for? Polka Dot Door. Okay, what's that? You know, it's like... <laughs> and just you know, going out and doing my best, just like any other audition. But but no, I I had no idea about it. Ted Connie Bear, um, interesting person. Passed away a couple of years ago. Um, you know, depending on who you talk to, wonderful to work with. Depending on who you talk to, uh, had had a bit of an ego. Was just really proud of Polka Dot Door. Um, was part of the team that created it, not the person who it originated out of. Um, right. But certainly a strong personality, according to some. Um, yeah. uh, you know, others others have fond memories. Tell me everything you remember about Ted and, and what it was like working with him. For me, fond memories. Um, but then again, because I've been in the business so long, I, I realize there's some actors that don't respond to people who know what they want and can give real direction about it. Um, they find that, um, like, oh, that person's being overbearing or whatever. I respect that. I happen to be one of those people. I love walking into a situation where someone is, when I know it's their baby and it's their passion and, they, and they're not just saying that or doing these things just to make themselves you know, feel better. It, it, they, they know this whole thing works. I mean, when you think about it, I don't know how many weeks they were actually shooting of the show, like in one year, but let's say they, they shot 20 weeks you know, in one year. That's like what, 40 actors because everyone's just doing one week. That's 40 actors coming in and out, and I'm just coming in for a week. I don't know the arc. I don't know what's going on for the rest of the year. And I like, as an actor, I like to rely on that there's someone at the helm who knows exactly what I need to be doing to make it all look good. Mm -hmm. uh, I think some actors want to take on more responsibility than it's supposed to be their responsibility, but I happen to like... I've also directed and I've also produced, so when I do that, that's something different. But when I'm the actor, I'm a vessel. And all I want is for you to tell me exactly what you want and how you want it done. And my job is to make your vision come true. My job isn't to sort of make my vision of it come true because I really don't know how my little piece fits in the larger mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. wheel. My little, I'm just a cog within the wheel of everything that's going. And that's what I liked about Ted. I think he 
he ate and spoke and breathed and slept polka dot door. He, I don't think he had another show. Mm -hmm. This was every single thing that he committed his life to do. Mm -hmm. And I had to respect that because polka dot door wasn't something I was committing my life to do. I was coming in for my one week. <laughs> so I just want to give do the best I could do and get out. But he gave a lot of information. Whether you wanted the information or not, I like a lot of information because it just informs you mm -hmm. about everything. Mm -hmm. And he loved to talk about the show. You never felt... I've certainly worked on shows where people at the helm, you get the feeling it's a job. And they're just like, let's just do it. Especially when it's a kid's show. Uh -huh. They want to, let's just do it and get out. You know, it's not, this is not brain <laughs> surgery. Let's right. just get out. That's not how you felt with Ted. This was brain surgery. This was important. And it was the most important thing. And you gotta respect that. <laughs> so I'm hearing from you, very, very committed, very involved, uh, clear vision. Yeah, yeah, and 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 you know, and for everybody that means something different. Some people might think, oh, that's like being a dictator. A director or whoever's at the helm, whoever's a showrunner, is a dictator, and they have to be. And I like that. And it's really interesting to hear you say that because, like you said, you hold credential because you've been on both sides of the camera. So you really, truly do I, understand the pressures yeah. of either role. And, and I like what you said about serving the vision of someone else. I think that's just a good life principle, you know, of what, good it, life means, principle. what it means to work underneath someone. Yeah. Um, speaking about how the show was shot, how was the show shot? You, you mentioned a couple of, you know, a couple of moments ago, um, you know, that the, the set was far off. Remind us again of where it was and did you shoot in blocks of episodes and were you there for a whole day or did you come in one day a week? How many episodes were shot at a time? What details do you remember? I felt like we shot two shows a day. That's how I felt. But somehow I think I was still there. No, I think we were there three days. I think um, either one day or half a day was just rehearsing. You know, making sure that you knew these songs and these words. There's no cue cards and there's no teleprompter, so you needed to know all this dialogue. Um, everything shot really fast, um, as I recall, but I could be completely wrong because I cannot remember. Um, and having shot daytime, as uh, like my soap opera, well, you know, that schedule is is sort of a similar kind of schedule. So, right. but I know we didn't block tape. I know that when you went in, we shot a whole show in the order that it was, and. I believe every day of the week was a special theme. That's correct. So when you saw Pokeroo, it was always like a Thursday. You That's know? right. That's exactly right. I, I think it was a Thursday. And then like Monday was always like there was a dress up day. Like every single day was themed in some way. And That's it was correct. the same for every single um, show. So I do remember that, you know, like this is the show where, you know, this is the focus. And, and, th and this show is more dancing and activity <laughs> kind of a show. And... Um, it was really blocked out very simply, but um, was it one camera? I couldn't have been one camera. No, there must have been at least a three camera shoot. <laughs> I yeah. don't believe it was a one camera shoot. Um, but everything was, was, it was um, it, down to a science. By the time I was there, um, you would just, you came on and the blocking was very quick and you just did. And there was much blocking, you're not going anywhere. Right. <laughs> and right. you just needed to, um, but things were important like holding the toy in a very specific you know, not just holding it here, it had to be held exactly where it needed to be held and, and those kind of things, which might have thought, well, what's the point in that? But if a kid is watching, there's a continu continuity for that kid looking at it week by week that it's at the same level as that host every single week. So it made it for a cleaner show. But and, and I'm sure was, Ted would be there behind the camera making sure that you held the... He was always on set. I don't remember him not being on set. Exactly. He, he was sitting... But most producers are on are on set. You know, um, it, now we have booths, so they sit in the booth, and you don't actually see them. But I don't think there was a booth back then. I actually think everything was right there on the on the stage with us. And you mentioned the set was actually quite small. Give us give us kind of a, an idea of what we were looking at. We have you know obviously where you tell the story, the story time clock. You probably haven't thought about yeah. this for a year. You know, yeah. here's a craft table, the actual polka dot door, and then was there not an outside scene as well with sandboxes and no, no, and I think you're imagining that all these are different sets going along, but the space was probably no bigger than what a regular living room would look like. Wow. And your, and your sandbox was, it was pushed in, <laughs> and then you were in the sandbox area, and then it was pushed out, and then you were, but it was the same area. It was a small area, and they moved things in and out. So it wasn't like they had built these four or five sets, and you move from this set to another set to another set. If it was a set about the park and a slide that was sh all put in, 
And of course we're editing, so they cut and then it all gets pushed in and then you come back and you're on that set and then something else goes on, but it's, it's you no, know, the space was very small. Like I, I don't think bigger than like a regular living room size. And you mentioned you did four weeks, so there'd be, uh, yeah. you know, five, five times four, uh, so probably 20 episodes total, would that be correct? Yeah. That would be right. <laughs> and if we were to, if we were, although they got played at nause, nauseum, as we as we mentioned before, you would guess that they would have been seventy nine. You think is probably when it started when you first did your first one. Yeah, it might have even been later. Now that I think of us, like eighty eighty one. Okay, the episode that we have found of you, the clip that we have is from nineteen eighty, so that would certainly work within that time frame. But that's not to say yeah. that you maybe did something, you know, the year before that. Yeah, so I would say sometime from 79 to 83 or 84, I did those four weeks. <laughs> because I know I started a sitcom called Check It Out in, uh, in 85. Okay. And, it's, I, I, and that was a daily show, so I know I wasn't doing anything after that. <laughs> um, did you know that when you were recording your final episode that it was the final episode? You mentioned how you'd just be kind of called randomly. So No, no. once you did your week, you could get called back the next year. You could have gotten called back five weeks later. You could have got, you know, you had no idea. So I didn't know when my last week was or wasn't or whatever. It was just another week and you said, you said bye, <laughs> you know, and you hope. When I did my first week, I didn't know if I'd ever get booked for another week. There's no guarantees. You just have no idea. So when the next year they booked me for another week, I was like, yeah, great. <laughs> you know, another That'll week. Work. Uh, was there any polka dot door merchandising that was done that you remember that you were ever brought in to be a part of? No, n none. And and even now, um, when you say that, were those toys sold? Did people could were, people buy a toy? There were at times. I've heard of puppets, uh, you know, that have been made that have been sold. I'm not sure if they were branded or, or sold through TV Ontario. You know, you'll remember that TV Ontario would uh, get public support, and I think that in uh, for a contribution, you could like get a plush doll of Pokeroo and stuff like that. Oh. Now, now in this in the 70s, Dennis Simpson and Rex Hagen and a handful of others uh, participated in a in a record that was created, I think, in '78, probably right oh, before wow. your time there. But uh, aside from that, those two things, those are the only two merchandising things that I'm currently aware of. Yeah, well, I wasn't, I, they, I, was, I was aware of nothing. <laughs> I wasn't asked to be in the record. <laughs> <laughs> You're probably 16 when it was cut, so maybe, uh, maybe I think it happened just a little bit before your time. We, right, talk, we talked a little bit about co-hosts. We, uh, we mentioned Peter. Do you remember any of the other co-hosts that you worked with, and have you, did you ever stay in touch with any of them? There was... Was a guy called Jerry? I, I, I'm no, I'm not in contact with anyone, and I know that um, Dennis Simpson passed away right. um, a few years ago because his sister's Gloria Rubin, and just once in a blue moon, you know, she'll email to to say hi. But she did several years ago say that he passed away, and he was living in Vancouver at the time. But no, I, there was a guy called Jerry, which I want to say had really curly, uh, dark hair, very okay. Italian or Greek looking okay. guy. I think I worked with him, but I honestly <laughs> can't remember. <laughs> I can already remember actors I worked with just last week. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you're part of the show, you come in, it's not a recording schedule like really any other TV show, but yet at the same time you're contributing to something that would later, you know, we look back now, ran from 1971 to 1993. And Unbelievable. A huge, huge cultural phenomenon in terms of children's television. Did, yeah. you, did you sense that at the time? Was there any sense of like, oh, wow, this is quite the institution? Like, obviously, you get on set, and boy, they're taking this all pretty seriously. But aside from that, was there any kind of, um, you know, sense of, wow, I got to be part of, you know, at the time? Were you able to see that? No. At the time, I did not see that at all with any of the work that I did. <laughs> you know, it was just, it was day to day. And I think I was, I think you just, I was just too young to appreciate that or understand that. It's later on when I would meet people like you. I would meet grown people. <laughs> who would be like, oh my god, I grew up with you, I grew up with watching you, because I don't even think I thought of the people watching. <laughs> I mean, I think, I was just thinking of, am I in my place, am I holding the doll, am I saying my words, am I blah, blah, blah. I don't think my mind was going, oh, there are children out there on the other side of the screen being impacted about what we were doing. That was really not what was running through my head, but as I got older and people would be, other 16 and 20 year olds would come up to me and now you're, you know, 30 year olds come up and go, this show really impacted my life. I go, wow, I had really no thought of that stuff. So thank God we did as well as we did. <laughs> we took it, because I really took it seriously when I was doing right. it, but I took it seriously more as I want to do my best. And you know, not that I was like, 
oh, I'm shaping the lives of young right, people right, here. Sure. I was not thinking sort of in that way. And, and that's interesting to note because obviously, you know, uh, I'm sure you would agree with this. Your your career has really, you know, your time on The Young and the Restless was really going to probably be on the forefront of most people. But would you still say that every once in a while that people will actually still remember you from Polka Dot Door? Do you get people? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, I still get people saying, um, oh, I recognize you, and I think they're going to say, The Young and the Restless, and they go, were you on Polka Dot Door? And I'm like, yeah! <laughs> and, and, and what's weird is the way they say it. They say it like I, like they keep their voice low because they think I'll be embarrassed. <laughs> I'm like, it, it's not like I was doing porn. It's like, it's, like, it's like I go, I'm incredibly proud of the show. I, I have great respect for, mm. for what we did now that I look back on it. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm totally thrilled when people remember me from that show. How, how does it make you feel to, to know now, looking back, you know, the people that my age, people, you know, uh, have come up to you and remembered it that, it, that it just has staying power, you know, especially in the world of YouTube and whatnot, where we can go and we can look up clips. How does that make you feel that this thing that at the time, by your own admission, you really weren't thinking about its longevity, more so of just doing a good job. How does it make you feel to know that it has a lasting impact? I think it makes me feel really good and the older I get I feel better about it and the reason is sometimes I'm horrified with what is passes for entertainment for young people in particular on TV right now it, it really scares me and um, the, the lack of the values that I not only did I grow up with but the, the kind of show like Polka Dot Door it instilled really amazing values. You could even go as far as saying, like Christian values, you know, in, in a lot of the things that it did. But I mean, I guess it went right across the board to anyone sure. who, who, who had those kind of values that we just took for granted at that time. And now I go, wow, I watch um, shows for young people and I'm like, those values aren't there. In fact, the values now in some of those shows are kind of like, you know, get ahead, push the other guy down. You sure. Know? Uh, like our show was really about being a community and loving one another and being gentle and kind and loving and those were the messages that were coming through with every single thing we did and so I think it's great to see people who are in their 20s when you tell me you're the age you are now and there you are you know in going to a it was teaching at a Christian you know university and the whole mm -hmm. thing I mean I feel that that was even a tiny little bit Absolutely. of all the things that impacted you. I grew up with the Brady Bunch and with those kind of shows, and I feel it impacted me in a very positive way to see those values. Now, amongst a lot of young people, they watch the American life of the, 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 the secret life of the American uh, teenager, mm -hmm. um, they watch Gossip Girl, they watch, it, is it, it's impacting our young people in a very different way and not always in really positive ways. So I think as I get older, I long for, if someone came to me right now and said, I'd love you to be in a show like a polka dot door again, I would do that over some other things because I think that's more valuable right now. <laughs> so I would wow. be, it, we need more of those shows and I hope young people are thinking about producing and making and doing those kind of shows because it's scary. I remember Sunday nights would be to sit and watch um, the Disney movie of the yep, week. Absolutely, on CBC. Yep. It really shaped who Absolutely. we are and how we saw the world and how we took care of each other. And, and sometimes you really don't realize it. You know, my, I myself am an educator, so I guess I'm more attuned to these things. And like we were, ex I was explaining off camera, part of my interest in history and archiving has come really out of a thankfulness for you know networks like TV Ontario, who really had folks like you guys at the helm, because it was an incredible. It was taking a resource like broadcast media and using it to benefit society and to make yes. society better. And, and I agree wholeheartedly with your statement. I no doubt there are things that were instilled maybe even perhaps by you on some of those episodes that ran over and over again that were shaping me as a child. And what a cool um, testimony to have, you know, that you had a, had a role in that. Um, well, what, what, when you say that too, what I loved is sometimes I was the only black person that little kid might have ever seen. When you think that TV Ontario was not maybe just in Toronto area, but in the outskirts where sure. some kids may never have seen someone black. Right. I get excited to know that if that was the first impression that they had of someone black, it could change any other stereotype things That's that right. they saw, that right. they had a balance of something. So 
that was more impactful for me, I think. And I really do think that TV Ontario on a whole, when I look at um, some of the other stuff that they did, they really did embrace diversity. And, and that, that was a, a, you know, working down here in the South, there's different types of challenges when it comes to racism. But one of yeah. the things I'm thankful for in my Canadian upbringing is that from a very young age, be it the people that were in my kindergarten class or be it what I saw on TV, it wasn't as isolated as I sense it was for kids growing up in the South. Here, absolutely, here. absolutely. And, and so there's a real, um, you know, there's a real, real thing that we need to, to celebrate uh, growing up yeah. in Canada and having that opportunity. Um, favorite memory of Polka Dot Door in light of kind of everything that we've talked about, you know, even when I say that, maybe perhaps a story come, comes to mind. When I mentioned this to Rex Hagen, he told me about a time that he, he held a gerbil and the tail of the gerbil actually fell off. So I, I don't know if uh, oh, no I, I don't know if you have anything quite comparable to that but but just something something favorite about doing the show um, nothing we nothing strange like that I'm sure things happened <laughs> um, I think the kind of things that would happen um, that I think were funny was I'm sure when we're singing and when we're dancing I'm forgetting words but I'm going with it anyway <laughs> I'm repeating them <laughs> I'm doing whatever I need to do to make it work. Or um, just something, you know, falling apart. Like <laughs> just, you know, the ladder, the the slide falling over, or sure. or something like that. But nothing, not no one specific. There were so many of those little things because you're shooting so fast, and you know, all these are very small little sets and things going on. So I'm sure there were just those little funny moments, but they not not one that jumps out like that would. I would remember that if the, the triple tail fell off. That's something you'd remember. <laughs> No, oh, nothing like that. Now, Tanya, I, I think I, out of all the, the the hosts, though, my most fun was working with Dennis Simpson because he right. was, I mean, he was just he was just so bigger than life, and he was just so into it as well, and uh, he made it really fun to work with. That's awesome. Now, I had mentioned before we have we have found this one clip, and uh, actually, I'm going to give you the link over Skype. I'd like to actually watch your reaction as you watch this, probably for the first time oh, sure. in, in 30, 32 years. Okay. Um, but as you're preparing that clip, um, I know we've talked a little bit about this off camera. But did you retain any pictures, or you mentioned a, you mentioned that you had somewhere an episode that was used, or a clip that was used when you when you received a reward? Uh, an yeah, award? and I know I can find that. I just can't remember what the scene was. <laughs> right. Oh, hold on, hold on. Okay. Was I'm there right. a, was was there any um, any pictures that you retained from the show, or anything else? No. I don't remember them taking any pictures. <laughs> I don't remember. I mean, maybe they did. I don't remember us taking any pictures um, of it. Can you imagine that that's just how we were? You know, it's hard to think of that time because we're such an obsessive culture right now about taking every good people just have their cameras they whip out digital cameras they're sure. taking quick little video things or whatever they're on the phone and they take a quick video and they send it to someone well you're talking back then we were still using rolls of film and, right and if I put in a 24 roll that probably lasts me a year right <laughs> and you kind of took uh, pictures of significant things like you know, your your mom coming and going to the CN Tower and right. something like that. So it just wasn't the same culture. We just weren't snapping pictures all over the time. Right. I mean, now I wish I if if I were now I'd be taking I'd be taking pictures of the the, the dolls and of the crew behind and sure. you know, whatever. It's just not the way that we were doing things at the time. Now, was it you telling you that mentioned at one point you thought you may have even had like a U-matic tape of an ep of an episode up in your attic or, or something that was on like a format that we don't even use anymore? Or, or were no, you no, no, no. Of... I was. It was the it was the CD up in my attic. I was okay. going to look for. Yeah, no, Very... I. What's what's U-matic? U-matic is a format even before VHS that was used in the broadcast world. And, no, uh... no, I don't have that. <laughs> Three three quarter inches when I started to collect anything. <laughs> Very cool. Well, hey, why don't you play that clip and let's uh, see? It's only sh it's only oh. a short clip, so feel free to watch the whole thing. But let's uh, let's see how you react here. Looking at it now. Okay, Dumpty. Now, what bird do you want to be? Hmm? A chickadee. Well, first I, I I'm seeing Ooh, I'm seeing how thin I am. <laughs> Because they look like Humpty and Dumpty look like they're real. <laughs> Their arms are moving, <laughs> and they're flying. <laughs> it's 
it's not even like we're throwing them. It's like they are flying out of our hands <laughs> to each other. See? <laughs> that is awesome. I don't call him Peter then. I call him Derek. Derek, I think so. That might have been the funny moment. <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe he kept going, why does she keep calling me Derek? <laughs> Well, you know, and uh, it, it's really sad, and I, I'll get your comments on this as well, but it's sad to think, you know, you, you said that your episodes would um, broadcast over and over again syndication, and it's sad 32 years later that that is, to our knowledge, um, you know, maybe perhaps the other clip that you have, but that is publicly the only clip that all we have. All that's left. All that's left. And, I, and that. I, I think my clip is your clip, <laughs> actually. <laughs> well, I don't think my clip is any different. We'll have to, we'll have to check and compare. But, but how, does yeah. that, how does that make you feel? That must be kind of sad in some sense, just because there hasn't been a preservation. Yeah, no, it's terrible there hasn't been a preservation. And um, it's funny that you're talking about it, because I have spent the last year, I not poke it out door, but... Um, yet because I now see how difficult it is but I've been collecting some other shows that I did there was a show called seeing things mm -hmm. remember that show no. I just got oh my god it was so great it was <laughs> it was on it CBC okay and it was a, a comedian that had his own show and he was like a psychic detective oh wow so and it this was, was in the 80s it's gotta be yeah, early 80s or something like that, somewhere around there. Um, but it was called Seeing Things. It was a very popular show, very big show on CBC. And I just got my episode from CBC recently. They had to go in the archives and get it for me. And I think I did two episodes of Street Legals, and they went in the archives. But at least I think CBC was has been at least uh, quite good at archiving things. Um, but maybe some of the other networks didn't. But I remember asking about some stuff that I did over at CTV. I co-hosted the Miss Teen Canada pageant for two years in a row, and they literally said, it's expensive. We needed those tapes. We would tape over tapes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because that's what, we needed, yeah, we needed the tapes. That, there's been a sense of that. Um, also, the CBC has been really good. Nina Keel, who I mentioned before, was the first host of Polka Dot Door. Her, she comes from a long line of puppeteers, and she was able to go to CBC, and they were hap happy to provide her um, with, uh, with with some of the material. So, oh, sadly, wow. sadly, from what I understand, it's all there at TVO, but because of copyright law and, and red tape, uh, it's not readily available even to the actors that were on the show and the saddest thing about that is that uh -oh. it's a crown corporation it's oh we pay our taxes for this so strange yeah. so they do have it they just won't give it out now I get it from my, from my understanding they do yeah. they have retained a lot of it and I'm, and I'm glad they did um, you know but whether or not we'll ever see the light of day with some of those episodes is a whole other question so wow. well we got to start something you got to start a, a movement where we all sign and, and that the government forces them to, to <laughs> They should be just on public domain. Well, why don't you give me kind of your one or two sentence statement right here, and then maybe if I get around to it, I'll, I'll, get, I'll do better. I'll give them a video clip, and we'll have Tanya Williams kind of petitioning for the release of this. But if you if you were to Absolutely. share one or two things from your heart about why this should be made available again and the importance of it, what, what would you say? Say so TV Ontario is an amazing channel, and Polka Dot Door, that particular show, impacted the lives of millions of children who are now adults and young people and it would be great since it was uh, government money that paid for a lot of this to be able to have that kind of archival show in a public domain so that a lot of people to go, could go back and revisit that piece of history that is so vital to the Canadian culture. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, and really the whole reason why I'm doing these interviews is to kind of make up for that lost time and to honor exactly. great folks like you that have contributed so it's much. It's great that you're doing this. It really is great that you're, you're doing this. You have such an incredible energy about you. I can see why you've been in the industry for so long because, Tanya, you, you attract people to you with your energy and you're, you're exciting to talk to and there is such a wonderful, great thing about you. I want to hear more about um, what you're doing with, uh, with Real World. You're the executive director and the founder and right. uh, I, I've looked at this a little bit, and from what I understand, you're really celebrating the diversity uh, uh, film of people of color that are that are yeah. in the industry and doing it. Tell us a little bit about it, how it got started, what your vision is for it, and how people can learn more about it. Well, as you were talking about before, once you get to the United States, you realize how we take for granted this sort of melting plot of pot melting pot of diversity that happens in Canada mm -hmm. um, and even though I live in Los Angeles and people think it's so diverse it's diverse but in a very segregated way 
like Latinos are together and blacks are together and whites are together and it's it's all very separate it's not really as cohesive as it could be um, and I didn't grow up like that so I love the idea of film festivals on so many levels one it helps filmmakers but it also helps an audience to appreciate um, the vision of these filmmakers on so many levels so I didn't want to do I mean the obvious choice was people thought I'd do a black film festival but I really didn't grow up that way so I want to do a festival that sort of showed all this diversity and so we program films from the Aboriginal, Asian, Black, Latino, Middle Eastern and South Asian communities and I love the idea of an audience member sitting in the audience and seeing sort of the blend of all of this. I really think it shapes that we see the world and as humanity as, as one humanity instead of you know trying to break it down into little pieces. Um, and, and that got me so excited and now we're going into our 13th year and I have to pinch myself because you know, when you start something like this, you don't even know if you're going to last one year. Right? And then by year four, you're like, how many years do we have left? And now we're going into the 13th year. And I, I really hope this is something that goes on long after I'm not around to be able to do this, that it just keeps... When, people are always saying, oh, is it going to be bigger and better or whatever? And I go, I try to make things better, but I don't necessarily try to make them bigger. Mm -hmm. I like the idea of making it stronger, meaning that it stands stronger on its own feet and that it just is is some sort of initiative that can really bring change not only for the filmmakers but for audience members who who may not know that much about these different cultures and I don't focus on the cultural part of it in fact my favorite thing is to look for films where people look different but they're doing exactly the same things that you would do um, because we don't need to be thinking that everything is a cultural difference um, because I'm black how I live my life is pretty much the same as how anybody would live their life. Mm -hmm. I don't have any specific foods I eat. I eat, I eat the same foods everybody else eats. I live in the same kind of house. I decorate in the same way that anybody else decorates. So I think it's important for us moving forward to show different looking people but doing the same things and that we're not, we're not different. If people want to learn more about it or even if people are in California and they want to attend it, can you give us a website address and at the time that this film festival happens? Well, the website is realworld.ca and it happens in Canada. Awesome. The, festival's, the festival's in Toronto so and it's every April and next year it's the 10th to the 14th um, and we do it at Canada Square up at Eglinton and Young. And, okay. uh, so 20, and in 2013 it's April what days again? April 10th to the 14th. To the 14th, wonderful. Yeah. Well this has been such a such a positive thing. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day and I know we'll talk in a couple of minutes when we're off off recording here but so many people that uh, are watching are so thankful for your significant contributions to Canadian television and uh, I know it's going to even be fun for those to tune in and watch this interview having known you from real world or having known you from Young and the Restless and to be able to see you know these these humble beginnings when you were talking to stuffed animals on Canadian television. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but, and how great it makes me feel to know that one of those tiny little kids <laughs> is now teaching at a wonderful university and doing <laughs> and doing um, a program on this so that's called full circle. That's beautiful. <laughs> Good stuff. Well, hey, I'll uh, we'll talk a little bit off camera here in a second, but thank you so much for your time and all the best with all your endeavors, Tanya. Thank you.